Hello everyone, thank you for attending today's webinar, GNSS in the Loop, the future of GNSS testing in a hill setup. Presented by Spark Communications, I'm Jess Biedman, Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Ali Solomon, Business Development Manager, and Ricardo Vediger Moreno, Product Manager at Spark Communications. You can read their biographies on the right side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the link in the resources list on the left of your screen. As an additional resource, at half time, we will be conducting a poll, which we would like you to participate in. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand after the event. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the question and answers tab on the right side of your screen. Okay, now let's begin. Ali, please go ahead. Thank you, Jess. And hello, everyone. We will cover multiple interesting topics in today's webinar. First, we will look at the trends in autonomous driving. We will also discuss the drivers for health testing and how to achieve realism within GNSS health setup. Then we will cover the benefits of implementing multi-frequency in your device under test. And finally, we will, we will look at GMSS Hell examples. So let's start with autonomous driving trends. The first trend to highlight is the increase in the mileage driven by autonomous vehicles on public roads. California DMV recent report highlights that as of February 2020, there are more than 60 permits granted for autonomous vehicle testing in California. 36 of those reported actual mileage and testing. This is testing with a driver at the back of the wheel. There are only two permits granted for testing with no drivers as of today. The number of miles driven by autonomous vehicle on public California roads in 2019 has jumped by 30% from previous year to about 3 million miles. There has also been an increase in the number of autonomous vehicle cars on the roads in California, as per the graph on the right-hand side of the screen. The report also highlights the number of disengagement reported. Disengagement is when a vehicle autonomous mode is deactivated due to a failure of the self-driving technology or a situation that requires the test driver to take, to take back control of the vehicle. The figures show that there has been a lower number of disengagement reported in 2019 for many of the permit holders, despite the increase of mileage driven and car use. This could be used as indication of progress made to improve the overall perception and prediction algorithms. But it is worth noting that this engagement indicator alone is not a reliable indicator to measure progress. The data doesn't include the many other miles driven in private roads tracks, or in virtual environment. Virtual driving in simulated environment is widely accepted as key to win the race to release the first full autonomous vehicle. Millions of miles have been driven daily in simulation to educate the perception and prediction algorithm on the different scenarios it has to deal with in real life. Waymo, for example, highlighted in recent report that a day of simulation is equivalent to 100 years of real world driving. Such simulation, when realistic and detailed enough, allows the developer to test as many corner cases as needed. Those corner cases are otherwise hard to replicate in the field due to their rarity. There are different approaches to simulation, for example, module in the loop, software in the loop, or hardware in the loop, which is the focus of this webinar. As of today, no industry standard has been defined for testing for level four and above, but there is a consent among the key players that testing and simulation is critical in developing a road-ready autonomous driving solution. Autonomous vehicle relies on array of sensors to see the world. This includes ultrasonic imaging, LIDAR, and millimeter wave radar. For perception, there is yet a clear approach as to the technology to be widely adopted for the mass market. In fact, multiple of these technologies will have to be implemented to achieve the desired overall system performance. 
LiDAR technology has been maturing quite well in the past couple of years, with many researchers and startups focused on this technology, arguing that this is the way forward for autonomous vehicles. Generally speaking, LiDAR is more superior compared to other sensors in terms of performing the free space detection and ranging of objects surrounding the vehicle. But there remain many challenges for this technology to be adopted widely. For example, cost, dynamic range, as well as robustness in some edge cases. Imaging sensors, on the, on the other hand, are relatively cheap and provide a high resolution image for object detection and classification relative to LiDAR. But computer vision technology has been lagging behind to make use of what the camera sees. This, among other limitations, has hindered the widely adoption of camera systems in autonomous vehicles without the need for LiDAR. Some argue to achieve autonomous vehicles quickly and safely, we may have to use both LiDAR and cameras. This is true, but the cost of such system will be a limiting factor for wide adoption. In summary, the battle between cameras and lasers remain ongoing. With no clear winners, some OEMs have decided LiDAR is not necessary, while others feel in the lack of a computer vision system that can match LiDAR performance, it is necessary to continue investing and considering LiDAR technology. All the previous mentioned sensors provide either a local or relative positioning to the surrounding environment. GNSS remain the only widely available source of absolute positioning. It does not require any additional information to operate. This makes it essential for unmapped territories, off-road scenarios, and futureless environment. Unlike other sensors, GNSS accuracy is not affected by lighting conditions or adverse weather conditions. The performance is immune to changes to the infrastructure, unlike HD maps-based solution. But GNSS technology does also have its own challenges and limitations, which we will discuss as part of this webinar. I will now discuss the driver for health testing, and in particular, GNSS. Hardware in the loop testing is an important stage of the test plan to ensure actual hardware timing and behaviors are considered. Health is essential to make educated design decisions, for example, evaluating a specific design alternative early in the development process based on the test data. It also enables developers to detect errors in the design early in the development process. By doing so, this reduces the cost of the design change. Test coverage could increase significantly using HEL. ECUs could be tested under extreme conditions that might not be practical for physical testing due to safety or equipment damage concern. Repeatability is another important factor that HEL enables. This allows the isolation of deficiencies in an, in an ECU, even if they occur only under certain circumstances. Finally, it increases the level of flexibility of the test plan. For example, simulating winter road conditions for a vehicle under test, even in the heat of the summer. Overall health testing reduces, reduces testing costs, for example, reduce capital repair and maintenance expenses for test fixtures without the need for physical systems. It also reduces the time to market and the risk of failure once the vehicle is on the road. Precise positioning is the ability to measure the positioning to view centimeter or better under good condition. Historically, this was used by a handful of applications, for example, surveying and precision agriculture. But in recent years, the demand for precise positioning has significantly increased, and many new applications are demanding few centimeter level accuracy or even better. For sure, autonomy is one of the biggest drivers for this. For example, connected and autonomous vehicles require lane level accuracy to achieve level three autonomy and above. An error of a few DC meters can cause the vehicle to localize itself on the wrong side of the road or can cause accidents to the vulnerable users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. Autonomous vehicles require robust localization systems with centimeter level accuracy. 
there are five main KPIs to consider for a positioning system. Those are integrity, continuity, robustness, accuracy, and availability. And timing is important too. A common and accurate clock source is essential for connected and autonomous vehicles. As an example for video x communication, common time frame for all the vehicles and infrastructure in the network is necessary. Also, synchronization of all the in-vehicle sensors to provide accurate sensor fusion and AI is necessary. GNSS is well positioned to provide such accurate time. Let's just say that GNSS satellites are the world time keepers. Now let's look at why GNSS need to be tested in a hill environment. The satellite signal travels over 12,000 miles from space to the vehicle. As it reaches the vehicle, the signal is at the noise floor and hence very vulnerable to many threats that could affect some or all the KPIs that were discussed early. For example, spoofing. Spoofing is the malicious hijacking of a vehicle's navigation system. This involves the broadcasting of fake false signal in order to fool onboard systems. This could be used to either steal a vehicle and its cargo or cause an accident. Spoofing can now be carried out at relatively low cost and there are tutorials on how to do it online. Interference is the most well understood GNSS vulnerability. It covers everything from malicious jamming attacks to onboard or out of band interference. The danger of interference are a loss of position accuracy and ultimately a loss of position altogether. GNSS segment errors are any errors originating in the satellite. Segment errors include the broadcast of incorrect BRN code and satellite system failure. Potential consequences are a total loss of position and functionality. Finally, there are many issues that could arise during the integration of the chipset or module into the vehicle. It's for all of those reasons a GNSS system tested in a hell environment is essential to achieve overall desired performance and safety level. Thank you very much, Ali, for this introduction to the key trends that we observe in the industry and their drivers. I think that it perfectly sets the scene to the next topic of this presentation. We have just seen the needs of GNSS positioning and timing information in our vehicle, and hence the need for GNSS testing. In this section, I would like to explore with you the different ways in which we can test our GNSS receiver, or ECU, and in particular, the possibility to add GNSS simulation to our heel setup. In other words, what we call in a show of inspiration, GNSS in the loop. When it comes to GNSS testing, three options are available to all of us, each of them with its pros and cons. In the first column, we have LiveSky. This is something that we can all do right now with our phones. Each of you can easily download an app in your smartphone that gives you information about the satellite signals we are receiving and the output location. This is easy to set up, realistic, and inexpensive. However, we don't have any control over the signals we are receiving. It's difficult to compare your results with a true position because most likely you know your true position thanks to your smartphone, which, by the way, is the system that you are currently testing. And obviously, the test scenario is unique and unrepeatable, whether there is a problem in our solution or not. There is no debug button for real-life tests. Secondly, we have simulation. With simulation, we solve most of the problems that we faced before. We have a true position as an input. We, ha we have also control over the signals we generate, and we can repeat multiple times the deterministic test. The challenge is, of course, to get as close as possible to real life. The challenge is to achieve realism. Finally, we have the record and play playback solution, which basically adds repeatability and some level of control to our live sky test. The problem is that you still need to go out and record your own signals, since they are dependent on the antenna used. When we talk about hill testing, we are always talking about simulation. 
This is the typical setup when we test our GNSS receiver with a given hill platform or motion generator. On the right hand side, we have our hill platform. There are several options available, such as this space, IPG card maker, or a scanner. From a GNSS simulation perspective, they are just motion generators that give us a vehicle trajectory in real time. In each GNSS simulation step, we will receive an updated model status coming from our hill platform. The GNSS simulator will process this message to update the vehicle position and generate the corresponding RF satellite signals. These RF signals will be continuously fed into a GNSS receiver, which will run its own algorithms to give us the current position of the vehicle as it happens in the real world. But how do we achieve realism? How do we bring real life scenarios into the lab? When we talk about realism in a GNSS simulation, we are not only talking about bringing the motion of the vehicle in real time, but also modeling the ionosphere and troposphere, modeling the antenna. We are talking about scintillation and the space weather as well. And of course, we are talking about multipath. There are several tools and features that can enrich our DNSS simulation. When we design a test, we need to ensure that we pick those that are relevant for our scenario to achieve the expected results. Or in other words, as we have said before, we pick those that help to bring the real life test into the lab. This is why in this diagram, we have decided to show you a typical hill setup, but also adding a Spiron Sim 3D. And I will talk about it a little bit more in the future. I like imagining a hill setup as an optimization problem. In a very simplified way, and from a purely technical perspective, we have mainly three variables to optimize. High realism, high control, and low latency. It's up to the system or test engineer to assign the weights to each parameter, and therefore, to choose the right tools which gives the desired outcome. Let me explore with you these three inputs to our equation and those considerations that we need to keep in mind when we are building the hill setup. So this is our first top and it is realism. One way to increase realism in our simulation is by using a virtual 3D world simulator. These simulators must have three engines to add real value to our test setup. These are the environment engine, the physics engine, and the solver. It's the interaction between these engines which adds realism to our test. The environment engine is the 3D world itself, including all the buildings, vegetation, traffic signs, terrain, etc. But it's also the materials assigned to each of these objects. And of course, it contains all the moving objects that are part of our simulation, but they are not directly related with our device under test. And these are, for instance, the pedestrians, traffic, or animals. The physics engine is usually a set of equations that tells the virtual 3D world simulator how to interact with the environment. For instance, in a DNS simulation, the physics engine contains the signal properties for each satellite. Also, it knows how these signals interact, interact with the environment basically how they are reflected, diffracted, or transmitted when they encounter different objects and materials. It also contains the propagation model, which says how the signals are propagated in the space. And finally, we have a solver. We need to discretize our equations and solve them in a fixed or variable step size. In a DNS simulation, for instance, we need to discretize the simulation time and the signals themselves. Nowadays, it would be really expensive for a computer to solve how a spherical si signal or even light propagation would interact with the environment. That's why the industry uses techniques such as ray tracing or path tracing to simplify the infinite continuous wavefront into a set of rays that we can handle and compute for. Hence, choosing which rays to compute is critical and optimize our solution it is as well. For Spirant, these three engines have a single word, Team 3D. Team 3D 
combines the three engines that we have talked about to add value by bringing real-time multipath and obscuration effects to the GNSS signals we generate. SIM3D is one of these optional tools that can help us to achieve realism in our test setup. You can see here three examples about how customers use SIM3D. The white lines that you see in the videos are the line of sights, the signals coming directly from the satellites. The red and blue lines are reflections and diffractions of the rays when these interact with the environment. But again, the use and benefits of these tools depend on your testing purpose. This is a nice example from a customer that wanted to test the reception of an INDAS DNSS receiver. Without a tool like SIM3D that takes into account the vehicle 3D model, it would have been impossible for this customer to achieve the level of realism required in this test. Let's talk now about our next parameter to optimize in our equation. We want to maximize the level of control. In a co-simulation environment, we will be constantly dealing with time-based versus event-based simulators. Time-based simulators generate output at a constant rate. For example, every millisecond, we will generate vehicle dynamics information in a driving simulator. Event-based simulators instead generate their outputs when a certain event occurs in the scenario. For instance, a B2X simulator that generates a warning message when your vehicle is about to crash. The tricky part is that not all our time-based simulators will run synchronously and at the same rate, and we will most likely have simulators that can generate mixed outputs, some of them time-based and others event-based. That's why having a flexible and comprehensive API that can handle both is essential. As an example, our GNSS simulator can handle time-based outputs such as vehicle dynamics using the UDP interface, but it can also handle events. For instance, the vehicle drives into a tunnel and the satellites are not visible anymore until it reaches the exit. In this event, we would turn off all the signals that we are generating. This is a critical and complex requirement that we need to satisfy not only in the short term for the test that we need to run next month, but also thinking in the long term. In a rapidly moving hill industry, buying a tool that fits its purpose for the next sprint, but it cannot scale up, it's a, it's a recurrent expense for your projects in, instead of a one-off investment. And finally, let's talk about latency. Let me show you first why latency matters. This is a simplified but realistic example, by the way. So we have our driving simulator, which is transmitting the vehicle dynamics to the XYZ simulator, for instance, a GNSS simulator. And let's assume that, the, that this XYZ simulator will send back the computed position that will be used internally by the vehicle to make autonomous decisions, okay? Now, the vehicle is on the highway, driving at 120 kilometers per hour. Eventually, it receives a B2X message containing a warning that a vehicle in its lane has suddenly braked, and the position of the, this vehicle, of course. The driving simulator will make a decision if it has to brake or not, and it will make this decision based on the input from the XYZ simulator by comparing the vehicle position that has suddenly break by, the big, by its own vehicle position that has been reported. If we perform some fast calculations, 120 kilometers per hour means that more or less in one millisecond, the vehicle would move three centimeters. Of course, in real life, all the events occur in parallel. However, in this simulation, things happen sequentially. First, we compute X, then we send X. We compute Y, we do something with Y. This means that there is a latency. Let's say that the latency of our XYZ simulator is 100 milliseconds. If we come back to the space domain, 100 milliseconds would mean 3.3 meters, more or less. Now, the driving sim simulator will probably break in this scenario. The problem is that compared to a real life test, we don't know where we would have braked within those 3.3 meters. This immediately converts our latency into test uncertainty. Lessons to learn here? 
first, that we want to minimize our latency and second, we want to know the exact latency of our simulators. Otherwise, we don't know the uncertainty of our test. My last slide is about how we can achieve low latency. The ways in which we can do it are simulator specific. Here, I will talk about how to do it in an RF or DNSS simulator. First of all, the big dilemma, FPGA versus SDR or GPUs. In Aspirant, we use our own FPGAs. We don't rely on commercial SDRs. That gives us full control over the signals we generate and helps us to reduce overall latency as well as optimize the hardware and the signal generation to achieve the desired accuracy and fidelity. The second point is about API flexibility again. If we have a flexible API, we can choose those communication protocols or mechanisms that helps us reduce overhead and keep latency to a minimum. There is a third point, which is the interpolation and extrapolation techniques that can come in handy to compensate for an unintentional loss of data. But we need to be really careful here, since some companies include these results as part of their overall latency. Definitely, that will help them to reduce latency in their data sets because you are continuously extrapolating your results. But in the presence of a sharp turn or high dynamics, even if your latency is really low in your data sheet, your results are wrong at that time step. In Aspirant, for instance, we will always tell you the maximum latency of our systems. And on the top of that, we would apply these extrapolation techniques if a problem occurs. At the bottom of this slide, you can see a diagram that depicts the different stages of a message since it is sent by the Hill platform and until the corresponding RF signals are generated. I've also highlighted the latency in which we are particularly interested from a Hill perspective. And of course, you have the values of latency for aspiring DNS simulators as an, as an example. At this point, I would like to hand uh, over the presentation to Jess for a poll. So Jess, it's all yours. Thanks, Ricky. We will now jump into the poll. We will revisit the results of this poll at the end of the webinar. All results are anonymous. So the question is, are you considering hill testing in your lab? Okay, so it looks like most of you have completed the poll, so thank you for taking part. Please note, if you are watching this webinar on demand, that your response to the poll will not be counted. I'll now hand over to Ali, who will talk to us about multi-frequency benefits and correction services. Thank you, Jess. I will now cover some of the benefits of implementing multi-frequency and correction services in your device under test. Before we look at how using multi-frequency contributes to the improvement of computed solutions in the receiver, let's first discuss at high level the main errors that affect GNSS measurement. The first error is the satellite clock error. Although the atomic clock on board the satellite is highly stable and accurate, they do drift by a small amount, and they are not perfectly synchronized with their respective system times. The error is typically measured by the control station and broadcasted to the user in the navigation message, but there are noise and uncertainties around the measurement. Hence, there remain residual clock errors which add to the ranging error. The next error is the ephemeris error. Just like the clock error, there is small residual between the true orbit of the satellite and the broadcasted orbit, which is monitored and corrected for by the ground station. But despite this correction, this error still contributes to the ranging error. Another major contributor to the ranging error is the atmospheric effect. The signal travels a long way from the satellite to the receiver. During the signal journey, it passes through both the ionosphere and troposphere layers of the atmosphere. This causes delays in the signal propagation and introduces errors in the measurement. The atmosphere and particularly ionosphere are tricky to correct for as they vary due to many factors, including time of year and solar activities. Finally, 
multipathogen shadowing effect. Multipath is a major contributor of error in the GNSS measurement, especially in urban environments. This phenomenon causes multiple copies of the signal to reach the receiver, a direct and a reflected signal. The reflected signal will take a longer path and will be delayed relative to the line of sight. Shadowing or obscuration effect will also cause major error in GNSS measurement. This happens when the satellite line of sight is obscured by an object surrounding the receiver. The sum of all of those errors will cause solar range measurement error, which lead to the error in the computed DPT. In this slide, I would like to discuss how multi-frequency help eliminate the majority of ionosphere error in the PR measurement. For single frequency, the receiver relies on a model of the ionosphere to correct for the delay, for example, Klobuchar and Nyquist G model. This approach corrects for about 50% of the error. It's important to highlight that the ionospheric delay is frequency dependent. This allows dull frequency receiver to use differentiating techniques to estimate and eliminate the majority of this error. In particular, the first order effect. High order effects need to be solved for two to achieve centimeter level accuracy which we will discuss further when talking about correction services. Multi-frequency reduces the residual ionospheric error to 0.1 of a meter from 7 meter for single frequency receivers. So if you are thinking about implementing multi-frequency in your device, you may be wondering what frequency should I go for, L1 plus L2, L1 plus L5, or even L1, L2, L5? The answer really depends on many factors, including the end application, design performance, cost, device and antenna size, and even constellation status. And how does that fit within your release timeline? In recent three years, new commercial specific signals on the L2 and L5 band has been implemented. The commercial L5 signal in particular has been adopted widely and is supported in the form of GPS L5, Beidou B2A, and Galileo E5. In the next couple of slides, I will discuss the benefits of using GPS L5 signal relative to the GPS L1CA signal. The GPS L5 signal enables the improvement of signal acquisition and tracking sensitivity. This is due to the pilot channel. The acquisition will be improved because longer coherent integration will be possible. This is important, especially in an environment where the received signal is low due to the lack of line of sight, for example, urban environment. Another benefit to highlight is the reduced probability of poles looking onto the wrong satellite. Isolation between the different codes will be better due to longer codes. This reduces the size of the cross correlation between different codes and as a result, reduces the probability of false looking. Another important benefit is improved measurement accuracy, both for soda range and carrier phase measurement. This is due to the reduction of random noise as a result of the larger bandwidth. The data-free quadrature component of the GPS L5 signal will enable longer integration, which will result in a better phase tracking accuracy and lower tracking threshold. Resiliency to multipath is another advantage of the GPS L5 signal. High chipping rate and larger bandwidth result in a, sh a sharper peak of the code autocorrelation function. This reduces the shift in the peak due to multipath signal component. Such characteristic would enable better detection and mitigation of multipath as seen in the figure. In terms of resiliency to interference, GPS L5 is promising improved performance compared to GPS L1. In general, having multi-frequency allows the receiver to use one of the frequencies if the other is jammed. For GPS L5 in particular, the narrowband interference effect is reduced due to longer code which decreases the energy per spectral line. Finally, the L5 signal falls within the aeronautical navigation band. This band is exclusive to the aviation safety services 
and is highly protected. To achieve centimeter level precision, multi-constellation multi-frequency alone is not enough, hence the need for other augmentation and correction services. In previous slides, we discussed that some of the errors in GNSS measurements are not totally eliminated by using multi-frequency. For example, orbital and clock error. There are several classes of augmentation and correction services that is used to enable precise positioning to, to sub 10 centimeter accuracy. For example, differential GNSS, precise, precise point positioning, and the use of external sensors. Differential GNSS takes advantage of the spatial and time correlation characteristic of GNSS errors. This is because GNSS error sources are highly correlated both spatially and temporally. If such errors can be measured by a reference station, and provided to the end user in a timely manner, the position accuracy of the end user will benefit significantly. RTK in principle relies on the carrier phase of the signal. By measuring the number of cycles between the satellite and the, receive, the, the receiver, and then multiplying this by the carrier wavelength, the, the range could be established. Changes in the signal carrier between epoch to epoch can be measured precisely by the receiver, but the number of holes carrier cycles from the satellite to the receiver is ambiguous. This is called the carrier cycle integer ambiguity resolution. This operation remains an area of research. Differential measurements between two reference stations are used to measure this ambiguity. There are multiple techniques to solve for this. Some relies on single frequency, but has long conversion, conversion time, while dull frequency allows for shorter convergence time. In RTK, the reference station broadcasts its precise location, code, and carrier measurements, as well as the integer ambiguity to the rover. This allows the rover to measure its position to a few centimeter accuracy, depending on the baseline. There are different variations of this operation, for example, network RTK relies on the use of several reference stations. Those stations, as well as the rover, regularly communicate to a central processing unit. The central station either sends a correction data to the rover or a corrected position. Another correction data service, which has gained quite a lot of momentum over the past decade is the precise point positioning, or PPP. The, the advantage of this technology is that it has a global coverage, as it relies on a network of global continuously operating reference stations. Those stations collect data from the different signals broadcast by each satellite, and then transmit them to the user over satellite or radio link. PPP correct for satellite clock and orbital error, combined with dual frequency receiver to remove the first order effect of the ionosphere, up to three centimeter of accuracy could be achieved. Unlike RTK, proximity to local reference station is not relevant in PPP. Despite many of the PPP advantages, there remain few challenges to achieve full potential. For example, the long initialization time is an issue for real-time applications, as well as the integer ambiguity resolution as previously discussed. A hybrid variation of both PPP and RTK has been developed. This will overcome the long conversion time of PPP, as well as enable atmospheric correction for this technology. This is, this, with this hybrid approach, there is a need for some infrastructure, but significantly less relative to RTK standard approach. It is also important to highlight that PPP standalone and hybrid PPP RTK approach use state space representative SSR rather than observation state representative OSR. The significance of this is that a single stream of correction data is transmitted to the rover. It is also a one-way communication. All this means less bandwidth, more flexibility, and easier handover, which is ideal for the mass market. 
Before we finish, I would like to share with you a few slides about heal examples with GNSS in the loop. This is our lab setup. It aims to replicate the most common test benches that we have observed among our customers. In terms of hardware, we have this space collection, which is generating the vehicle dynamics as you can see in the bottom screen. We also have the GNSS simulator that receives the motion updates and generates the RF signals in the top left corner. Sim3D is also part of this setup. This is the top middle screen, by the way. In this setup, we are sharing the CT3D model between the DSpace environment and Sim3D to calculate all the DNSS multipath and obscuration effects in real time. These signals are then fed into a DNSS receiver, which is in the top right corner, so we can correlate the output position of the receiver with the generated vehicle dynamics using the spaces collection. In terms of vehicle kinematics, if you are interested, we are simply gathering six degrees of freedom data from the spaces collection. This is position, velocity, acceleration, jerk, and the corresponding angular parameters. Then we perform any required frame conversion to ensure that the vehicle data used in the DNSS simulator matches the frames used in the Hill platform. And we finally send a UDP message with all this info to the simulator. As you may have probably observed in this presentation, one of the key elements in our co-simulation environment, or Hill setup, is the actual interaction between the simulators. I'm talking about the software interfaces. This element must be compliant with the quality standard of the simulators involved to provide expected level of performance. It must consider as well the end user in the design and development phase. Currently, and in general, Hill setups require one or more engineers to configure and run a simple test. This is a really expensive way of testing. By delegating operations between simulators, simplifying interfaces, and unifying the user access to the system, we can definitely reduce costs in our testing process, which in my opinion will be a natural next step for the industry. For instance, instead of, a config, uh, of configuring and running a test with a team of engineers, an engineer could set up the test and a technician could run it afterwards. For all these reasons, at Sparen, we have been working for the last three years with leaders in the automotive hill testing industry, such as DSpace, IPG, AV Simulation, and National Instruments. Thanks to that collaboration, we have come up and released a new product called SimHill. SimHill enables its users to integrate our DNSS simulators with their preferred hill tools. We have applied the concepts that I highlighted before, so tests can be set up and driven by the most common hill tools in the market. In other words, you can now configure and run GNSS scenarios from your driving simulators or real-time systems without actually using our GNSS simulator Wii. And I would like to finish this presentation talking about other sensors. You will see in a minute why. We all know that localization and navigation is not only about GNSS. As technology goes on, we keep discovering and adding new sensors and mechanisms to provide accurate and robust positioning for our vehicle. One way or another, we all end up testing all these different solutions. And we should do this independently, but also in orchestration. This brings a new challenge for testers. How do we cope with all the different simulators running simultaneously to test the system or the vehicle? Sparent is well aware of that challenge and we have been in, involved in complex projects that directly address these issues. That's why we don't limit ourselves to GNSS. If we can bring more tools and data to the test, coming from the same box, simplifying network operations, and adding value, we will certainly do it. And as we keep exploring other sensors and signals, we want to let you know that the Sparent has been providing for a long time coherent IMU simulation with our DNSS simulators. This means that you can get out of the same hardware DNSS data 
and IMU data from accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, and, bar and barometers. You can add deterministic and stochastic errors to the IMU data and stream it over CAN or Ethernet to the device under test. This greatly simplifies complex hill systems in which you need to feed a sensor fusion engine or just a common filter with coherent DNSS and IMU data. So hopefully at this point, today we all have learned a little bit more about hill testing. And I would like to give you some final ideas about what we have been talking before. The first one is the importance of hill simulation to achieve the desired performance and test coverage. Nowadays, we are talking about millions of miles to be dri driven, and I think it's important to move part of this test from the roads to the lab. We have also talked about multi-frequency and the benefits in accuracy and integrity that can bring into our solution. Also, in this world that we are all thinking about centimeter accuracy, it's really important to take into consideration also correction services and augmentation systems in our final system or vehicle. Finally, I would like to reiterate in this idea of realism, control, and low latency. In this presentation, we have shown why these three factors are key in your heel, in your heel setup. It's your responsibility to assign the weights to that optimization equation and our responsibility to deliver and guarantee the desired outcome. Technology is also a hungry beast for testing, and we have seen it not only in this presentation, but in our past work. No matter how weak is our system, we'll need to test it. As we keep increasing the amount of requirements, signals, ECUs, redundancy systems, and so on, we also need to provide a comprehensive test methodology in the most simple way. That's why we need to focus on our interfaces. Thank you, Ricky and Ali. That was a really good presentation. So before we jump into the Q&A, let's have a look at the poll results. So, um, Ali, perhaps you could talk us through these. Yeah. Uh, so I, oh, look, it's really interesting in terms of the, the yes, we have more than half of you uh, are considering to add to use hell in within your testing, which really uh, matches what we what we think is the importance of hell testing. Uh, and I hope some of the information we shared today will be helpful for you. And if you if you need any uh, any any more help, please uh, get in touch. Uh, Thirty three percent of you don't think hell testing is needed. Uh, I, I hope some of the materials shared today will maybe change your mind at one point or when, whenever you you're ready to implement it. We obviously. Uh, to help you, uh, and uh, about 10% uh, say I uh, know the the already implemented cell uh, in their setup. No, that's brilliant, Ali. Thank you. Uh, so um, yeah, we've got just about 10 minutes to go through some questions. Um, so um, first question, um, actually, before I do that, I just wanted to address something. We've we've actually had quite a few questions around the jamming and spoofing capability. GSS 7000 um, and we'll, we'll come to you directly on those as there's lots of options available um, but so we'll um, specifically address the hill question in so, um, first question I think for Ricky uh, how do I integrate my receiver into my hill setup okay so so yeah that's a good question as as we were seeing in this presentation I think that the first step would be to think about that equation that I have shown and to think about what are our conditions for that setup. And then when we know what we want to achieve, when we know which, with, with which level of uncertainty we want to achieve it as well, uh, we, we need to choose the tools. And those tools can be developed sometimes in-house, so you can have your own driving simulators, for instance, or other sensor simulators, or it can be commercial. There are commercial options, as we have co uh, commented in this presentation. And I think that once you have it, uh, I would recommend you just to follow a slide 40 that was talking about the different process of how we convert uh, all the motion information into something that can be understood by a DNS simulator. So at the end, that motion that comes out from your driving platform is going to be the 
the way you synchronize the space in which you are uh, running your simulation. So you can use it in several simulators uh, simultaneously to produce different results. So if you manage to achieve so, and you manage to send that motion into uh, the 7000, for instance, or a GNSS simulator, to integrate your receiver, you just simply have to connect it through the RF, because at the end, that's how the receiver is getting the data through the RF. And the last step, just to have the perfect setup, I think that you would need to feed back all the information from the receiver to your driving platform and or the driving simulator, and that would help you or that would help the system to make decisions when it's driving. Yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, Ricky. That, that's brilliant. Um, so moving on, um, like I said, we've got quite a few questions, so we'll get through as many as we can. Next one is for Ali, I think. So what are all the GNSS error sources you can simulate or vary in your simulator? Yeah, so uh, using Spiral Simulator uh, and our POSAP application, you can have full control over, over the, the three segments of the constellation. So that's the ground segment, the space segment, uh, and the user segment. Uh, things like orbital data errors, you know, atmospheric effects, error in the data even uploaded uh, from the control station to the satellite, uh, uh, that could be simulated. Even uh, up to each individual bit of the navigation message could be controlled. So uh, we, we do give the user full control over all the parameters that could affect the PBT computation uh, in any of the three segments of the constellation. And, and I'm confident to say that Spiral Simulator provides that level of control uh, and uh, it, 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 any, for any test that you, you could think of that either happen in you know, real life or rarely happen, you'll be able to simulate using our simulator. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, th thanks, Ali, very good. Um, next question for Ricky. So our Hill platform is not supported. Can we integrate our Hill platform with your simulators? So yeah, here you have several options. So as I said in the presentation, we are currently supporting uh, platforms coming from this space, IPG, AV simulation, and national instruments. But it may happen that you have your own uh, in-house developed uh, platform or you have another commercial platform that we don't support, that's not a problem. Uh, the first option would be that you could uh, develop that interface, you could integrate it. It's quite, uh, it's a straightforward process. Uh, as I saw in the slide 40 again, uh, how we were transforming that motion into something that POSAP can understand or our simulator. And we provide all the material and all the documentation that you need to um, to achieve that integration. But if you don't want to do that, of course, Sparring can do it also for you. So we offer a, a, a wide range of professional services in which we can directly integrate that tool for you, or we can give you a sample code that you can use to integrate in C, C++, or whatever you use. Um, so, so yeah, there are several options here. If, if it's not, if your tool is not among those. And I would just recommend this person to contact us and find the, the best way for him to, to achieve that. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, so another question for Ali. GNSS does not cover many places that do not have a direct satellite view. Can you talk about that, please? Yes, uh, that's a really good question. And, and uh, of course, uh, m one of the major challenges for GNSS in, in urban environments is, is the lack of line of sight, uh, which we call shadowing or obscuration effect. Uh, in, it, this is one of the major contributions to error, as I mentioned in the webinar, and, and this is one of the main reasons uh, other sensors uh, that augment GNSS in this environment are uh, essential. To, to achieve that desired level of performance and safety. For example, uh, IMU, IMU sensors uh, and the other sensors that I discussed in the webinar. But it's also worth mentioning that uh, even for uh, obscuration and shadowing effect subjects, there have been lots of research recently, and there have been, we see quite advancement in the mitigation of multipath in urban environment uh, and the use of uh, some new techniques like um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand if that signal is coming from a multibar or, or a line of sight uh, and 
and correct that error accordingly. Uh, so uh, one of the software, one of the solutions that we highlighted today is Sim3D. And basically Sim3D helps with, uh, with testing for multipath and obscuration. So I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great, Ali, thank you. So I think we've got time for another, um, for Ricky this time. So um, on slide 15, um, we talked about record and playback um, and having no reference truth. Why is that and can it be, by, can it be supplied by a Spirant simulator? Well, that's a really good question, actually. And what I would say that in general, it's true that maybe saying that there is no reference true is a huge statement. But to be honest, um, it's really hard to get that reference truth because imagine that you want, let's, let's assume that we want to fly a drone, for instance, and we want to know actually the path that that drone has followed. Uh, here, I mean, the first, maybe the first thought that we could have, oh, we, we take the DNSS data. Well, that DNSS data actually is not your truth data. It's just the data that the receiver is giving you with all the errors that we have been talking about is producing uh, into that device. So it's difficult unless we spend, we can, we can use, for instance, differential systems. So we can have a differential network in which we send corrections to that receiver and we can achieve a better accuracy into that reference truth. But again, this increases a lot the cost of testing in uh, record and playback. So I would say that especially for automotive, when you are driving in a city, it's quite difficult to get a reference of your trajectory um, just with the sensors that we already have. It's, it's difficult, but of course you could do it, but you are assuming some error. So, so yeah, I, I think that I agree with you that maybe we could discuss about it, that there is always ways of finding uh, better references and maybe improve them. And I'm sure that in the future it would get better. But uh, in general, it's a hard thing to do. And that usually requires that we spend a bit more, uh, more money in the test. Thanks, Ricky. That's really helpful. So um, that is actually our Q&A over. We are running out of time, but we've had some really good questions. So thank you very much. Um, we will respond to them all directly, so we will get back to you. Um, so thank you very much for attending this webinar and for submitting so many great questions. Thank you very much to our speakers, Ricky and Ali, for participating in today's webinar. And thank you all for joining. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording early next week. Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you all.